Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. My name is Adam, Content Marketing Specialist with Henry Schein, and I'll be your moderator. Today, we are joined by Dr. Jason Goodchild. Before we begin, I'd like to remind all attendees that today's webinar is being recorded, and everyone will receive the link of the recording in the next week. If you have questions for Dr. Goodchild at any point during the webinar, please type them into the Q&A section, and we will answer them live at the end of the presentation. This webinar is sponsored by Premier Dental, and no CE credits are being offered for viewing or attending this webinar. Dr. Goodchild, thanks for being with us. Take it away. All right. Well, thanks, Adam. Uh, and thanks to everybody who's joining us this evening. When I was thinking about putting this webinar together, Successful Crown and Bridge Restorations from Preparation to Definitive Cementation, I thought, you know, wouldn't it be nice if we just uh, were able to kind of look at that Crown and Bridge procedure as a bit of a story where we're going to start from, let's say, treatment planning and all the way to definitive cementation and, and talk about best practices or pearls along the way um, so that, um, you know, maybe there's something new you'll hear or, uh, you know, a review of something that you've heard a long time ago and say, oh, you know, maybe I should, should re, you know, start reincorporating that again, or just, you know, sit back and enjoy the ride, uh, because I'll show a bunch of cases. And uh, I think it's always fun. Uh, again, I always think it's maybe even funny to think that, you know, as dentists and dental people, we enjoy actually spending time looking at more teeth. And so I'll show you your fair share of teeth, and uh, and I uh, again hope that you'll have a, a good time along the way. Uh, my name is Jason Goodchild, and uh, uh, just a little bit of uh, an introduction of me. Uh, first, uh, please, that's my email, uh, jgoodchild at premierdentalco.com. And if there's any questions or comments um, after the webinar, please feel free to reach out via email. Uh, if there's something that uh, you know that you see during the slideshow, and uh, you know you would like to incorporate it into something you're doing, uh, please don't hesitate. Again, I'm a sharer, and so I'm happy to uh, uh, send uh, as much information as you need if, there, if there's anything that you might want. So a little bit about me: I uh, am in private practice uh, just outside of Philadelphia. I was born. Uh, just on the other side of the river from Philadelphia in uh, Camden, New Jersey, and have resided in the Philadelphia area for most of my life. Um, went to University of Pennsylvania for dental school, and um, education has really been my passion. And uh, I'm, uh, you know, my day job is a vice president of clinical affairs for Premier Dental, and, and that's. Uh, that's fabulous. I, you know, I get to do so many cool things uh, from new products to marketing to education and KOLs. Um, but education has always been my passion. And so I'm able to serve on the faculty of several dental schools, uh, which gives me the opportunity to stay connected to the next generation of dentists, but also, you know, um, pass along the experiences and uh, you know, all the learnings that I've had over the past 20 something years in dentistry. So a little bit of a, a, a uh, an interesting day-to-day -day existence in the profession, but it's just so much fun. Uh, you know, you get to do the clinical practice and the education and then uh, talk about and help develop new products and uh, uh, and get them into the market so we can help uh, um, our profession and our patients. So uh, having a great time and, uh, and want to share some of that knowledge with you guys this evening. So let's jump in. Uh, I really love to start with this saying, especially when it comes to crown and bridge, because... Um, it's, it's perfect. I mean, you know, when you think about crown and bridge procedures, you know, how many times do we do this over the course of a full year of practice? All right, let's say we do 180 to 200 days a year, and we really like to have one crown a day, if not more. So we're thinking about we could have 200 plus individual units of crown and bridge. That doesn't even include uh, um, uh, multiple units or or even implant stuff. So I mean, conventional crown and bridge happens so often in the dental office. Um, but when you think about it, conventional crown and bridge is just a series of smaller procedures from prep to tissue management to impressioning to provisionalization, if you're still doing it uh, uh, that way, if you're not milling in the office, uh, then definitive cementation. And so you have to complete all of those little procedures to actually add up to a positive outcome. So I like the success in dentistry is mainly dependent on doing the basics well. And when you think about the basics, it's like, hey, did I do a good prep? Was my prep, you know, did my prep allow me to do tissue management effectively? If my tissue management was effective, well, then my impression should have been a slam dunk. And then if I've got, I've done that part right, then making a provisional should be easy too, and the gingiva should heal around it. On the second visit, if I've done all those first parts right, well, then the gingiva should be healthy and I should have no problems you know, designing a, a cementation protocol, using the right products with the right substrate. 
uh, and then you know putting it all together for that positive outcome. So again, success in dentistry in, in everything we do, really, but I think Crowned Bridge really fits it well, uh, doing that basics well. And I love what Tony Robbins says, success is not an accident. And uh, again, perfect for what we're, we're talking about this evening, Crown and Bridge. Uh, you know, you just don't get to take that, take that black striped diamond and wave it around the tooth and, uh, and, you know, in 30 seconds and make a crown prep that's going to sort of, you know, help you out along the way. Or you just don't get to put that goopy stuff in someone's mouth and it magically turns into a beautiful impression. Or you just don't get to stick that cement inside the tooth and smash it down on the tooth and it just works great. Uh, so again, you know, it's, it, these are very prescriptive, deliberate things that we do that hopefully when we do them all right, lead up to a positive outcome. So I, I think it's a good place to start. Um, and again, you know, this is actually, even after 20 something years, uh, in clinical dentistry. And when I speak to colleagues or, you know, when I speak to, uh, group practices, uh, I've done some education for some of the uh, larger uh, DSOs. Uh, this is still an issue. So I don't care how long you've been in practice. Uh, the idea of having a discussion with patients around uh, direct restoration versus indirect restoration is still something that I think is a challenge for, for a lot of practitioners. And, um, you know, it, it's actually one of those things, you know, again, using good verbal skills, uh, good treatment planning skills, good soft skills, all that, all that stuff I think is a part of it. Um, but, you know, dentistry is one of those trust businesses where, you know, a lot of the stuff that we prescribe for patients, they can't see or feel. And so using tools at your disposable cameras, uh, you know, visual aids, that kind of thing, but also kind of word pictures and analogies, I think really helps as well. Uh, and then actually having some criteria that you try to practice by on a daily basis, things like, you know, when a filling uh, includes a cusp or uh, it's bigger than one half the intercuspal distance. You know, I'm always thinking about a crown and talking about patients about, hey, you know, if we, you know, this is a filling, it's as big as it can possibly be when it goes wrong and all things in dentistry will eventually fail. Um, you know, it can't be filled again and we'll need to have a crown on it. So we're starting those discussions early on with our patients and we're continuing to have those discussions. Because like I said, I'd much rather have a patient say to me when the day comes for to say, hey, listen, this one needs a crown, you know, it's time. They, they will say back to me, uh, Jason, you've been talking about that forever. You know, I, I, um, you know, we've been, you know, I fully understand and, and I'm ready to do that versus like you haven't talked to them about it at all. And then they respond, well, gosh, I had no idea of the, of the condition of my teeth. So I'm always communicating with patients about what's coming on the horizon for them so that when that day comes, you know, they actually are just ready. They're preheated and they're ready to go. Um, and so that doesn't really have a lot of education and convincing or even selling. It's they understand what's going on with their teeth and what the next treatment steps are going to be. Um, and so when I think about that discussion, indirect versus direct, the most important factor is the size of the lesion and destruction of tooth structure. Um, and you know, when I think about that discussion, I, I sometimes tell patients, you know, a filling really doesn't strengthen the tooth. The filling only just fills that hole or the missing space that uh, that w we had to take away or was taken away by fracture. But if you have to gain strength, meaning the tooth needs more support, it, we're really not talking about direct restorations. We're talking about indirect restorations. And I think a lot of people will understand that when you talk to them about like, hey, 75% of this tooth that is above the gum line is a restorative material like silver or plastic. You know, it's just not le that much left of the natural tooth. You know, if, and again, if it's an important chewing tooth or it's, you know, your last first molar on a, in, on a side, um, you know, those are important teeth. And I think patients begin to understand those biomechanics is that, you know, those little teeth, um, they're not as effective as those bigger teeth in the back for chewing. And I love the saying, I don't know who said it, but it's back teeth are for chewing and front teeth are for show. So it's this idea of, hey, we're going to protect those back teeth. And sometimes it means we have to cover them up to protect them. And additional factors that may necessitate, again, I love cameras. I love visual aids uh, to take pictures of teeth so that people can understand what's going on. And, and we look at the teeth along the bottom there. You know, it's obvious that all of them definitely need crowns. Um, and maybe even multiple crowns in some cases. Um, but, you know, additional factors that may necessitate the need for an indirect restoration, large failing restorations, cracks, symptomatic and possibly even asymptomatic, endodontically treated teeth seems to be the slam dunk. Whenever people get an endo, 
seems like automatically they're, they're, they're treatment planned or scheduled for a crown. Cuspal fracture, especially in the posterior aesthetics. Okay. And then, then we have to think about how to put it all together. You know, when we, when we, we can sit down and we talk about our patients, uh, to our patients about, you know, do they need a direct versus indirect restoration? And then when we, you know, or get them in the chair to actually perform that indirect procedure, let's just call it a single crown because that's a very, very common procedure. In fact, according to the American Dental Association, in a restorative dental office, the two most common procedures are a class two composite and a single unit crown. So it's something that, again, 180 to 200 days, you may be doing 200 single crowns or more. In fact, the last year I actually kept up on this and kept stats in my office. Uh, it's been a couple of years since I got that granular, um, but it was uh, 406 single crowns in a year uh, was the last time I kept track. So again, again, I'm not trying to boast or anything, but it's one of those things that we do so often, it should be cruise control. But part of that cruise control for Crown and Bridge uh, should be the understanding that so much goes into it and we need to do each one of those steps effectively, otherwise it's not gonna lead up to a hole. So what about that first visit? You know, if you think about a first visit, is it 45 minutes, is it 60 minutes, is it 90 minutes for a single unit crown? Uh, you need to prep the patient, you know, get him into the chair. And then during these times, there may be additional uh, infection prevention measures we want to take. Provisional matrix impressions would make an provisional. Anesthesia, this is sort of a rate limiting step. We have to get good anesthesia or it can't proceed. Make a tooth prep. We have to manage the uh, tissue. Make the impression either conventionally with impression material or with uh, uh, scanning. Then provisionalize and then cementation of the provisional. So there's a lot to take place during that 45 to 60 minutes. Uh, and again, getting all of those things right is the key. Um, and again, I get all these little sayings and I'll give you another one, which is efficiency in dentistry. What does efficiency in dentistry mean to you? What does it mean to me? It means for me, um, working quickly, but also getting it right the first time. So if I'm gonna be doing my prep, I wanna make sure it's right and I don't have to go back and touch it up. And tissue management, you know, do I need to use cords and paste and a comp cap? Do I need to throw everything at it to make sure it's gonna be right so that I can make my impression perfect on the first attempt? So again, it's just, how do these things build off of each other? And you know, when we think about what should our goals be for our first visit and second visit during the Crown and Bridge procedure, right? Our first visit goals have to be the impression. Uh, you know, it's you can't move on to the next part without getting a good impression. And then, of course, the second visit if, uh, is actually getting that crown in the patient's mouth. Oh, and by the way, if they pay their bill, that would be wonderful, too. But I think from a pure clinician standpoint, uh, proper cementation, proper occlusion, you know, prevention of postoperative sensitivity. Those are really the big things that we're thinking about as a second visit success measure. What about the second visit of a single unit crown? Uh, what are the things we need to, take, to, you know, to accomplish? And how long do you guys set aside for this procedure? Is it 15 minutes in a side column in your overflow chair? Is it a half an hour, you know, 40? I mean, I don't know. I mean, wh what do you guys schedule for this? Um, a lot of people I know do a sort of in a side chair. Uh, remove the provisional crown and clean up any excess cement, and sometimes this requires anesthesia. Fit and occlusal adjustment of the permanent crown, um, repolishing, and then final cementation, and uh, obviously checking occlusion. So there's still a lot to be done within that 15, 30 minute, 40 minute time frame. And when it all goes so smoothly, I mean, it's, it's just wonderful, right? But when it doesn't, let's say the contacts are just too tight or the occlusion is really high, especially in an all zirconia crown, um, that can throw a monkey wrench in things. Uh, that's why to me, hopefully, this evening's talk is really gonna be valuable, which is, hey, if I can focus on getting each one of these little procedures right, it really should lead to that drop-in crown. Uh, it's almost the garbage in, garbage out philosophy. So again, if I've done everything right, hopefully I get that drop-in crown where it just takes me you know, five, 10 minutes uh, to actually sit down and actually get that in the mouth, get it cemented. So hopefully I've kind of already told you this, how does the first visit impact the second visit? And I've gone through all this already, but I you know, hope that, uh, that we all appreciate the idea that uh, you know, a good prep, uh, 
you know, is so important for everything that follows, including the definitive cementation, tissue health, margination of the provisional restoration, uh, excess cement, uh, you know, all these things on the first visit will definitely impact that second visit. All right, so I like a back to basics approach and we'll run through these, these, uh, these uh, parts of the Crown and Bridge procedure pretty quickly. So let's talk a little bit about the preparation. To me, this is everything, uh, you know, after treatment planning, right? Because that's the roadmap. But after treatment planning, uh, prep is most important to me because everything that follows after the prep uh, you know, is gonna be, you know, the success of those kinds of things will be influenced by the preparation. So what is a, a proper preparation or what's the goal? It's to transform the tooth by a planned process to a uniformly reduced geometrical form with a closely defined finish line and permitting sufficient space for the planned restoration. And to me, perhaps the fourth part is most important, uh, permitting sufficient space for the planned restoration. Uh, you could do a beautiful restoration, but if you just haven't given the technician enough space, uh, that's gonna be a bear to insert and you may, you know, uh, drill through it. I mean, or just make that occlusal surface very, very thin. Uh, when zirconia, again, I remember when when full contour zirconia came into the market, we talked about 0.4 to 0.6 millimeters of uh, occlusal reduction in the posterior um, for a sort of a Bruxer or all zirconia crown. And even though that's probably true in the posterior, that's very difficult to achieve clinically. That's why in most cases, you know, labs would really prefer one to one and a half millimeters in the central fossa for an all zirconia crown. So giving them the space to actually develop the contours of the teeth uh, or to establish aesthetics is so important. So a little bit more reduction is probably better than a little bit too little, uh, at least in my mind. And when I looked at actually, you can, this is one article from JADA and uh, this slide was, uh, I originally made it when I was speaking to a DSO and uh, they wanted me to talk to their younger practitioners about um, you know, all the problems that they were facing and, um, and how we could troubleshoot and getting them to think about their preparations. There's a whole long list here, inadequate tooth reduction on the incisal occlusal, inadequate tooth reduction on axial walls, over reduction, excess taper, inadequate buildups, industry. So lots of things that can go wrong and to me, that's why I believe that when you get the prep right, everything else should follow very, very smoothly. Uh, and when we think about not only impression material, but then the introduction of scanning, uh, optical impression making, the idea of rounded internal line angles and rounded preps and no sharp corners, all of these things uh, um, are really so, so very important. And again, our attention to detail, detail has to come out during these times. Okay, so if I distill it down to the three most important factors to always keep in mind for your preps, it's taper, height, and reduction. If you can think of those three things and get those three things right, um, then in most cases, you're in good shape. Uh, when it comes to taper, right, remember back to dental school when um, you know, they would wanted six to 10 degrees of taper and they would hold up a sharpened pencil. Maybe that's all they did for my school, but uh, they would hold up a sharpened pencil. And if it was more tapered than a sharpened pencil, you failed because a sharpened pencil is 15 degrees. You know, six to 10 degrees, if we're talking about on teeth is pretty much, uh, you know, I don't know how many times we're able to achieve that, but 10 to 20 degrees should be your, your clinical goal. Um, as we increase taper, we decrease, uh, we decrease retention. And um, so, you know, that's really a, a super important um, uh, factor. Height, remember, uh, four millimeters is the minimum occlusal gingival height for, uh, for a crown prep. Uh, if you break that rule, less than four millimeters, you know, adjunctive uh, retentive features are probably necessary. Slots, grooves, divots, stuff like that to increase retention if your tooth is less than four millimeters. If you're always having provisionals come off and the tooth is less than four millimeters, you know, that's part of the reason why. In fact, a little bit of a sneak peek, when we get to provisional restorations, the number one reason that provisionals come off is, is occlusion. So, you know, and occlusion probably has to do with, did we reduce the tooth enough and give ourselves enough space? So all of these things kind of interrelate. Uh, and then reduction, we mentioned reduction, the idea of uh, allowing enough space for a technician to build out the contours, occlusion, and develop proper aesthetic. So if you think about these three things, uh, again, I think you're off to a really good start. 
And uh, uh, some schools have this. This one's from Loma Linda. Uh, you know, I love this idea of uh, um, convergence or taper gauges and things like that. You know, clinical practice, I usually don't do this, but I, but I certainly do review my lab work. You know, you go into the lab and you pull out all the cases and you look to see, hey, did I do that crown prep okay? Or, ooh, that one was tough. I remember that patient couldn't open very wide or we were working on a second molar and I could barely see the thing. And you're thinking, how did it look after all was said and done? So there's a way to evaluate your lab work to see, you know, could I do, you know, did I do the best I could? Um, you know, if I had to do it again, could I do it differently? Uh, and then looking ahead, when I review lab work, I usually think, all right, do I have enough tea, uh, a tooth to use the cements I'm thinking about? Do I want to use glass ionomers? Do I want to use resins because I need more strength? So again, it keeps that, that planning process going uh, as a part of reviewing your cases. You know, that's just me. I enjoy doing that sort of thing. Um, have you ever gotten a crown off that looks like this? Uh, an anterior tooth where a crown keeps falling off and you see that prep on the left and you see it's, you know, kind of over tapered and a little bit short. And you think to yourself, well, how should I fix that? And the way to fix over tapered preps is to uh, parallel, you know, par uh, parallel them uh, specifically in the gingival third. And as you can see on the picture on the right, I didn't do much when it comes to, I didn't reduce it anymore, obviously. And I really didn't do anything else but maybe square it out along the incisal edge a little bit. But what I mainly did was to achieve better parallelism or decrease taper in the uh, gingival third of the preparation. And I took what was an over tapered prep to a very nicely retentive preparation just by reprepping that finish line, essentially changing it from a sort of a beveled prep to a, to a chamfered prep. And one of the, you know, there's lots of burrs, lots of burr companies. Um, you know, I'm going to give a plug to Premier and just say, you know, hey, we've got solo burrs, which they've got 150 shapes. They come in individual packs, and sterilized for use, uh, wonderful tools. But I also want to show you this case. Um, this is a case I did on a friend, a fellow dentist, actually. And uh, he actually wanted Emacs or glass ceramic crowns in the posterior. I said to him, uh, Nick, you know, maybe we should do something else. He said, no, that's what I want to do. I really want glass ceramics. So we did it. And as you could see, I tried to give myself plenty of reduction here for glass ceramics. And if I'm being critical of myself, I thought the tissue management worked out really well. If I'm being critical, I should round out those sharp edges a little bit more. And when we think about glass ceramics, you know, we're thinking about butt joints, shoulders, chamfers, that kind of thing. And, um, that picture on the bottom that shows all the different finish lines, that always reminds me to, to, to say that, or at least to ask the question, uh, do you guys think that there is one finish line that's better than others when it comes to um, creating a, a better seal or closed margins or you know, um, resisting uh, secondary decay? You know, is there a margin that stands out amongst all of the others uh, that's better? Uh, and in truth, the answer is no. Uh, literature kind of says that when everything else is done right, meaning the, the prep is good, the impression is good, uh, and the crown is good, finish line shouldn't be a major factor in the uh, success longevity of the crown. So uh, you, when you think about it, right, you know, using the right finish line for each individual clinical situation is important, but also it's about setting yourself up for success. Right? So do I need to extend the finish line? Uh, do I need to be subgingival because of uh, aesthetics or restorative material or fracture? Uh, or can I keep it high and dry and I can use uh, a you know, chamfer or shoulder uh, like you see here uh, and, uh, and, and really match prep with substrate? And so, you know, just understanding that the prep finish line isn't a huge determining factor because if everything else is done right, it should all work. But hey, you know, how do I match uh, finish line with substrate? How do I set myself up for success with each clinical environment? Um, you know, is the gingiva healthy or is it less than healthy? Uh, is it an area where I can keep it dry or not keep it dry? So again, all these things are continuing to be at play. And of course, that's the key, right? Match preparation with crown substrate. And you think about the difference between a PFM crown prep, because that's how I was taught, you know, old gold, PFMs, uh, chamfer shoulder kinds of preps. Um, when I think about now prepping for full zirconia, 
there may not be a lot of differences except for the amount of reduction that is needed. So all the same preps we were doing for PFMs, we could do those for zirconia too. Uh, we just might not need to reduce as much. So when you think about prep guides, you know, and there's lots, I just pulled out a few. I mean, you can go to uh, the, the web and find uh, an infinite number of prep guides for each individual material. Um, but when it comes to PFMs, we may have been talking about one and a half to two millimeters of reduction, especially uh, on the inclusal surface. Whereas maybe we're talking about one to one and a half now with zirconia and the prep styles can all be the same. We just don't have to be as aggressive, which is wonderful, which is really, really good when we think about preserving natural teeth. And again, just more pictures of zirconia versus PFM versus glass ceramics. Uh, and like I said, major difference between PFM and zirconia preps really could come down to amount of reduction. Uh, again, we're, we're, we're developing reduction or creating reduction um, based on the on the kind of material and and then also the aesthetics that we need to provide if we're talking about glass ceramics you might need more reduction to actually change color if the stump is very dark um, you know even using opaque cement might not be enough but using a little more reduction so that they can develop the color in the material itself is actually something you may have to do Okay, so as we uh, we talk about all these factors, uh, this was a case we did a long time ago. Excellent preparation design gives the laboratory technician the opportunity to create the beautiful aesthetics. And you could see I try to do everything just just right. You know, prep was perfect, uh, tissue management was just as good as I could be, and then the final the final case turned out beautifully. And you know, it was easy to do. Uh, the impression was easy to make. Uh, the lab tech had an easy time making it. Uh, and then cementation was just a breeze because uh, you know all this stuff was done right up to that point. So, and we had happy patient too. So that was really the payoff. What about tissue management? Um, you know, placing cord is something that we all do. Uh, it's cheap. Uh, there's lots of different sizes. Uh, there's twisted and braided and knitted and. You know, we use it because it works, but it's also traumatizing. Um, and studies have shown that you could see up to one millimeter, they actually say 0.9 millimeters, 0.9 millimeters of gingival recession just from the act of placing cord. And the idea is to place the, the size cord that you need and not bigger, because as we get a bigger cord, it's more trauma to the tissue. And why did we actually start using cord in the first place? Well, we started using cord in the first place to make up for inadequacies in our impression material. So it was the idea that you know we could get impression material into a sulcus, but we couldn't get it out because it was always tearing. Um, so the minimum width for a sulcus back when our impression material was our weak link was 0.2 millimeters. So we really wanted to create a minimum of 0.2 millimeters so we can get the impression material in and get it out without tearing. Now with the advent of uh, um, PVSs, um, uh, vinyl materials where their tear strength is through the roof, um, you know, it's not as a huge of, of, an, of, a, of a thing. Now we talk about cord for um, deflection of tissue so we can actually visualize finish lines, um, but it is traumatizing and in fact, we still talk about a double cord technique. You know, the idea of placing a cord, prepping down to the height of the cord, putting a second cord on top, pulling the second cord and leaving the second cord in for the impression. Don't forget to take that first cord out, by the way. But, you know, there's a lot of trauma going on. Um, and, you know, and especially if we're able to keep uh, prep lines high and dry and, you know, maybe not impact uh, aesthetics, you know, maybe we don't need as much cord. There's still a lot of people using cord. Well, there are also probably a lot of people using putty and uh, or paste, uh, and these are considered to be less traumatic to, to tissue. Uh, they have pluses and minuses. Uh, the first one was Exposil. Um, then you see the 3M product, and then there's uh, our product, Traxident, which is just awesome. Um, I was a big fan of this product even before I was a Premier employee. I just think it's the perfect viscosity, and it's so easy to rinse. Uh, but why do people use paste? Um, I, you know, I usually think it's not because of the deflection of tissue, although you can get a little tissue retraction. It's more for the hemostasis and drying because the active ingredient aluminum chloride is just awesome. And in a clay system, these are all clay-based, uh, you get even more absorption by hygroscopic expansion. Uh, just a really, really neat products. Um, you know, they do add some extra cost to the whole thing, but Again, if the impression is our goal and we can't move forward without the impression, I'm throwing the whole kitchen sink at it. I'm gonna use the cord, I'll use the Traxident, I'll use the comp cap, I'll do everything, you know, the traction cap, 
to make sure I get it right the first time. What about impression? I won't spend too much time here. Uh, this is a patient uh, who's, uh, um, I really wanted to try something out on him. This is his patient's name is Jake. And um, young kid who'd uh, busted up his two incisors in sports and that during his, you know, when he was a kid and they'd been repaired with composite resin. You've heard that story so many times. But I really wanted to try out um, the idea of um, forcing impression material into the sulcus with pressure. So we tried a couple of different ways to do that, and I didn't want to use cord, but I wanted to just try out techniques. And so I actually offered Jake, you know, Jake, do you want to let me do these crowns for free? And he was just so, so happy because he didn't have the, the money to do it. Otherwise, he would have done it before. But he let me take pictures and actually take a video and try all kinds of different things. In fact, that's a prototype impression material at the time. Um, and, uh, you know, I... I made some beautiful preps. Impression was easy. There's no cord there. All we tried to do is just force that impression material uh, around the tooth under pressure, match it up with some, some pictures for the lab, and then end up with a nice result, which he was just so, so happy with. Uh, so again, uh, an impression is really an unequivocal negative likeness or copy in reverse of the surface of an object an imprint of the teeth and adjacent structure. So it's not just the teeth, but it's other things too. Um, you know, it's the uh, surrounding teeth and gingiva as well. All right, let's talk a little bit about provisionalization. Now, provisionalization serves lots of functions, and we know this, right? We know that it protects the teeth, uh, it, you know, it, uh, thermal sensitivity, uh, you know, aesthetics, occlusion, all that good stuff, um, but also phonetics. And um, the things that we want in an impression, uh, a provisional material, is it a jet acrylic? Is it... Uh, um, bisacryl material, um, you know, what are we looking for? Uh, all these things, handling, com biocompatibility, dimensionally stable, strong, wear resistant aesthetics. Um, and most times I think a lot of people are using those bisacryl materials like uh, Integrity, ProTemp, uh, Luxatemp, those materials work very, very well. There are still people that are using the cold acryl acrylic or, or temp and crown formers, that works fine too although they're not as uh, dimensionally stable, at least in their setting phase as we'd like them to be. Uh, and you have your choice. So there's lots of different choices to make provisionals. Um, the reason I show you the, this slide is because I want to tell you the story of Christine, and you see her on the right. And um, she, uh, again, this goes back to good verbal skills, and I certainly failed in this one. Um, she had this, this, this is the way she presented, and she had broken number 12 and needed to be extracted. So she's wearing a three unit provisional from 11 to 13 with this is basic real material like Luxatem. And when she was back for her hygiene visit while we were trying to figure out uh, um, when we could get her back in to finish up that, that uh, bridge. And she actually looked up at me and she said, um, what do you think about my laterals? What do you think about these little teeth on the side of these big teeth? And I said, uh, well, they look a little short. And she then just opened up and she said, I hate them. It makes my teeth look like they're huge. And I said, well, then I stepped back and I said, all right, what, if you could have it your way, what, what would your teeth look like? Well, then she pulled out her phone and she had all these pictures of smiles that she really liked. And actually, she wanted to do a smile makeover. And I didn't even ask her. I should have. I mean, I failed. I should have said, hey, you know, now's the time to really think about your smile if you want to, because we've got 11 to 13 to do. You know, how could, uh, uh, you know, how would you like to change it if you want to change it? And she could have said, no, I'm fine with it. But she didn't. She wanted to make a change. So um, we actually came up with uh, a smile design based off of her. Uh, her input, the pictures that she found on the internet that she smiles that she liked. And uh, I did it old school. I did a wax up and she approved the wax up. And then we moved on from there. So I prepped the teeth, and these are sort of like three-quarter crowns or the three-quarter veneer preps. And, um, and you could see how much care I took with these preps. And, uh, you know, I didn't have, there's no cord in there or anything. That's just, you know, the preps uh, uh, on the day we, we, uh, we made them. And I used a bisacryl prevent, provisional material. And on the bottom, you can see that's one unit provisional from six all the way to 13, with six to 10 being basically veneer preps or three-quarter crown preps. I thought, oh, my gosh. This is fantastic. I'm never going to get this again. I got to take a picture of this. This is awesome. I, I mean, I can't believe it's in one unit. I thought for sure I'd break it. It'd be multiple units or whatever. And I was so excited. And I'm you know, beaming along. And then I realized I don't have a clear temporary cement. Oh, and I said, oh, my goodness. This could actually go sideways pretty quick. 
but that's all I had at the moment. So, I mean, I didn't lock it on. So I had to use a cement in this case and that's the cemented case. And I was, oh my gosh, that looks terrible. And uh, I almost didn't want to show the patient, her name is Christine, but I had to because Christine was, uh, and she still is, an on-air TV news personality in my town, uh, in my area. So I can watch her read the news. And uh, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this is terrible. You know, people on the TV are going to see her, their teeth and they're going to, this is the end of my office. Um, so I sat her up and I sort of sheepishly gave her the mirror and she goes, oh my gosh, that's awesome. I love it. I was like, whew. I knew at that point this was a slam dunk. I could do anything for the final restorations and she was going to love it because at this point that's just terrible. Um, so she leaves the office and, um, and that was sometime early in the week. I get a call on Friday afternoon and she says, Jason, we have a huge problem. I said, what's going on? She says, I've got to go on air in a couple of hours and I'm now I'm lisping. I said, oh my gosh, uh, you know, I think I know what's going on. Why don't you, can you get to the office right away and we'll fix it up? So she did, and we were able to change the um, um, the contour of the provisionals, and so everything was fine. Uh, and then we went on to finish the final case, and that's the final case. Um, that's just glass restoration, the you know, glass ceramic restorations. Uh, but uh, you know, really does help always remind me that uh, provisionals serve so many functions, not just this, you know um, protection and function, but phonetics is a big part of it as well. So I'll never I'll never forget Christine. What about cementation? Well, lots of different provisional cements, and you got to understand that there's so many categories. There's resin-based, zinc oxide eugenol, zinc oxide non-eugenol, and then there's polycarboxylate, which a lot of people consider to be a provisional cement. Um, our cement, Next Temp, it's got all the good stuff. I mean, it's got you know uh, potassium nitrate and chlorhexidine and fluoride for all the prevention of sensitivity. Um, and it's resin, so it's strong. Then there's Tempon, which is a fantastic product for a ZOE. And then there's Temp Grip from Dense Supply Serena, which I really like. Uh, so, you know, you know, you can pick the right cement for each individual clinical situation. And the way I think of provisionals is as a blueprint. Um, so think about this case. This case's name is Matt, and he's a young guy. He's like 20 years old. And uh, he's got retained baby teeth. He's got uh, congenitally missing teeth. And we went around and around with him and his family for like six months on treatment planning. Now, how would you treatment plan a case like that? You know, was it implants? Um, is it, you know, you know, fixed, you know, conventional crown or bridge fixed, uh, you know, uh, case? Is it, uh, is it dentures, is it partials? You know, and there were so many things to consider. Uh, we Again, we did all the consults, ortho was involved and everything. And at the end of the day, he decided on fixed. I really thought that, you know, maybe we should do something else and then try to, you know, save up for implants. But that's the way the case went uh, after so many discussions. In fact, there were times when I even saw um, him and his parents at the local convenience store. We have a Wawa near me. Uh, it's like a circle K and they would stop me in the Wawa and they would say, you know, Hey, I'm thinking about this, you know, can we do this for my case? And I would say to them, look, Hey, I'm just picking up my morning coffee. You know, can we, can we talk about this later? But this went on for a long time until he finally decided and we came to some understanding. So here's the case. There are the preps. Um, and uh, there are the first chair side provisionals that I made. Uh, these are just relined uh, lab provisionals. And so what I wanted to do is try to establish occlusion, establish aesthetics, fun phonetics, and see if he liked it. And if he liked it, we were going to finish it up. My plan was to keep him in these provisionals for, you know, uh, a few months, actually, to, to work out all the bugs. And then that's my second provisional. So we worked on aesthetics and phonetics and occlusion. We actually worked on a second set of lab fabricated provisionals. Uh, there's the provisionals from the occlusal. Then we scanned the case. Actually, we did an impression, then that's scanned with three shape. Then we started to mock it up with our uh, frameworks. This was going to be a, zir a pressed, zircon uh, pressed uh, glass ceramic over zirconia. And then here are the frameworks in, in, uh, in the mouth. That's a uh, one piece zirconia framework on the bottom and then two pieces on the top. And there are the frameworks from the occlusal and there's the final case. Uh, so, you know, what would you cement this with? Would it be a provisional cement? Would it be a definitive cement? Uh, the reason I did it as um, glass over zirconia was because uh, I could repair it. Uh, and I did cement it with Duralon polycarboxylate so that it got with a little Vaseline in it so that if I, I could get it off if I need to and I could repair it. Just thinking again, he's, is it, you know, Matt's in his 20s. He's got a long life ahead of him. 
and I want to be able to service this, this prosthesis. But uh, really nice case. This is the kind of guy that uh, when you uh, put some stuff in his mouth and you took him from where we started to the, where we ended, um, I mean, a young guy, uh, a young guy, young male, uh, jumps out of the chair, starts crying, I'll never forget, and hugged me so hard he broke my loops in two. And, you know, I, I just sort of got wrapped up in the moment. I didn't care at that time. We just, you know, we're just celebrating. But I'll never forget the way he jumped out of the chair and broke my loops. But uh, it was definitely worth it because uh, to, to, for him, it was a life-changing thing. All right. Let's talk a, little, uh, a last look at definitive cementation as our last part of the journey. And remember that pre definitive cements have been around for a long period of time. The most recent one is self-adhesive resin cement. But there are really just four major categories of definitive cements in the United States currently. Glass ionomer, resin modified glass ionomer, self-adhesive resin, and then traditional resin. And do you know which category your cement falls into? Because there's pluses and minuses for each of them. And I tried to make one cement chart that kind of brings it all together. Right, and so I've actually put up some of the uh, the, the common products that you, you you see here. There's a Multilink and a Calibra, Maxem, uh, of course, Reliax and, and the Reliax family, and then our our entry ZRSEM, which is in that self adhesive resin category. And I put this this uh, chart together and talks about the four categories, but it also kind of gives you some properties and strength and aesthetics, ease of use, technique sensitivity. Recognizing that on the right side of the graph where resin is involved, you get aesthetics and strength. On the left side of the graph where it's glass ionomer, you get ease of use and potentially like fluoride uh, uh, release, maybe even moisture tolerance. On the resin side, you need, you need uh, isolation. So ease of use isn't as good. So there's these trade-offs when it comes to cement. And then when you factor in the substrate, you realize that, okay, if we're going to be doing resin, we probably need to be thinking about I'm sorry, when you think about uh, um, glass ceramics, you probably need to be thinking about resin. And when we do zirconia, you probably could use anything you want depending on, depending on your prep. And then what makes it even more confusing is how do you treat those crowns? Well, remember for glass, silica race restorations, we need silane. Um, what about zirconia? Well, we don't use silane and we don't use, um, we don't use uh, hydrofluoric acid, but we may use like a cleanser, like an IvoClean or something like that. We may use uh, sandblasting for zirconia. We may not do that for glass ceramic. And so it just gets very confusing with cementation. And if I had to kind of have some fun with this graph, uh, I've added in here um, <laughs> some strength, uh, you know, recognizing that self-adhesive resin maybe be that Goldilocks category where it's strong enough, but also gives you a little bit better ease of use. Uh, on the GI side, not strong, but easy to use in fluoride. On the resin side, strong and aesthetic. So picking the right cement, you know, based on your substrate and clinical situation is very, very important. And I've tried to put some buckets together. Um, on the glass ionomer side, I mean, the Fuji products are fantastic. The Lyax looting, uh, uh, really nice products. I love uh, Doxa, the uh, Ceramere from Doxa or Calibra Bio from Densupply Serona. Really neat products from calcium. Uh, illuminate materials. Then on the resin side of things, there's just so many choices, my goodness gracious. Uh, I'm gonna show you a case of our new ZR Sem and tell you why that's actually one that you probably should consider. But so many choices on the resin side. Again, uh, the usual suspects being sort of the relaxes and the multi-links and the max sems. There's so many. My gosh, there's just so many. So as a tool, I've also developed the idea of a stoplight approach. All right, so you know the idea is that um, you know, wouldn't it be nice if you had some way to say, all right, this cement probably is good for that clinical indication. And so I tried to put together some tools where we have some, um, for it's a retentive prep along the top for your PFMs and your zirconia, you can probably almost use anything. When you get into all ceramic, you probably need the strength of, of resin. Inlays, onlays, you're probably not using glass ionomers, you're using resin again. Uh, then when you get into the non-retentive prep, it's a whole nother ball game. But uh, we're assuming that we have a retentive prep. This may give you some, some indication about uh, what cements may go with, uh, with what substrates and what clinical situations. On the top graph, it's interesting to note that the self-adhesive resin kind of gives a yes to everything. Now, um, you certainly could do traditional resin, which means you know, you're doing a separate bonding or adhesive step where your PFMs are zir zirconia for max strength. But 
you know, does it just add more procedural complexity? Does it uh, increase the time you need uh, isolation? Uh, so yeah, you could certainly do traditional resin, but you know, maybe you just need the ease of self adhesive resin in those cases. Let me just show you a quick example. Uh, again, if I think about all the crowns we do, um, aren't they first molars? All right, aren't they three, 14, 19, and 30? Those are the ones we do most often. So I just picked an example of tooth number 30 and I used our ZR Sem. Why is uh, this new cement so nice and why do we like it? And why am I gonna spend like 10 seconds telling you about it? It's because it has all the good stuff in it, right? It gets the easy handling, it gets you the, the, the shades you need, but it has the 10 MDP monomer in it, um, which um, uh, really has been shown to work so well with zirconia and that's hence the name, ZR Sem. Uh, no refrigeration needed. It uses a different catalyzing system and good shelf storage uh, of two years. Uh, we also use barriers. Uh, this is kind of a new new thing for us at Premier, the idea of, uh, um, and I think it's a wonderful time to consider barriers. The idea of these are polyethylene plastic coverings to cover everything in the office, essentially, you know, all the things that specifically that can't be reprocessed in the sterilizer. So our syringes, our etched syringes, our flowable syringes, our cement dispensers and syringes, all that stuff we can use with disposable barriers on top. All right, so here's uh, the sleeve it with the ZR Sem that I was gonna use in this dual barrel uh, uh, um, uh, syringe. And there's my final prep on tooth number 30, and this is an all zirconia crown. Uh, here you see the crown uh, right before I put the cement in, and you can see the dye. Now, what did I do to the crown to increase retention? Well, I recognized that it was a bit of a short prep, so I added those grooves mesial and distally to add a little bit of extra retention. Then with any dual barrel syringe, you should always be bleeding the syringe twice. So once without the tip and then once through the tip. After I put it into the barrier, I then can dispense it onto the pad, then right into the tooth, right into the crown. And a little bit of a pro tip, I actually prefer that I add a little extra cement in there because with resin cement, I like to have a little excess to make sure I can get it off, get it off easier. I can see it and then get it off. And there's the crown seated on the tooth. And you can see I've got that little thick, that thick band of excess. I mean, on part of it, that's a little bit too much, but I really want to have a, a band of excess around the whole tooth to make sure that I've can see it and get it off, but also ensure that I've got uh, all the inside covered and the margin is properly sealed. And then I can tack it. And in this particular resin cement, I can go up to three seconds on a side. So three seconds buckly, three seconds lingually. And then the beauty is that picture right there. That is awesome. Where I can just peel it away in one big piece. So easy, still rubbery. And then I just, I have the dental assistant put her finger over it and I can floss mesial and distally and I'm good to go. Now, the, the, the last thing I'll tell you with self adhesive resin cements, especially when it comes to non light transmissible crowns, uh, is that, um, you know, not a lot of light gets through zirconia, somewhere between 10 and 20%, you know, on your best day, depending on thickness. Uh, so after you zap it with the light, buckly and lingually, it's important to stabilize the crown and let it, seat, uh, let it uh, sit for the full setting time. In this case, uh, ZR Sam uses four minutes from the start of mix. So I bite on a cotton roll, a stick, whatever, until full set, and then you know that you're not going to have a problem um, as the patient's walking out the door, and then they, oops, they have the crown in their, in their hand because you didn't let it set underneath that non-light transmissible material. All right, couple last things, we'll wrap it up pretty quickly. Matching cement with crown, I mentioned some of this stuff before. Um, uh, hopefully this is all review. The idea of a glass restoration needs silane, um, you know, hydrofluoric acid and silane for glass. For zirconia, there's no hydrofluoric acid or silane. Uh, it's usually like a cleanser like IvoClean, maybe a metal primer. Um, in this case, we just introduced a new metal primer uh, universal primer from Premier, but you may have heard of uh, like Z Prime and Monobond and those kinds of things. Uh, those are all, com all other competitive products. Couple last words, and again, I want to run through these because I think there's they're pretty important. When it comes to hydrofluoric acid, and I won't spend too much time on it because I know we're going to run out of time. Um, hydrofluoric acid is good for creating that etching pattern in glass containing restorations. So that would be like Emacs and Celtra. There's lots of other brands, uh, but it's not appropriate for your zirconia. It won't do anything on zirconia because there's no glass in zirconia. But remember, hydrofluoric acid is like one of the most awful things we have in the office. I mean, it's very toxic. 
It's very dangerous. If you've ever gotten some on your, on your stainless steel sink, you know what I'm talking about. It'll etch up your stainless steel sink. To me, and this never goes in the mouth, by the way, never, ever, even with a rubber dam, don't put hydrofluoric acid in the mouth. It cannot be neutralized with water. So it's really going to do damage if you get it on tissue. Um, to me, I got, I've gotten rid of um, a hydrofluoric acid in the office, and I only use a product called Monobond Etch and Prime, which uh, kind of will do the etching and the priming step on one, and it won't be as toxic to the patient or to our team members. What about silane? I think we all understand about silane. It's for glass. Again, it's a bifunctional monomer where one side uh, reacts with the glass and the other side re reacts with the resin. So again, it's for the glass-containing restorations. Not so much zirconia, although there is, some there is some research to show that a metal primer that includes silane on zirconia actually may help. So it kind of the supercharger to your primer, but primarily silane goes on glass. And there are, again, a lot of products that you may have thought about. Again, I think the, um, the Monobond uh, product, Monobond S was just the silane. I don't think you can get that anymore. Now it's just Monobond Plus, which has the as as adhesive monomer, the metal primer and the silane in it together. Finally, what are metal primers? Um, metal primers kind of serve the same function as silane on glass, uh, but what really are metal primers? They're essentially uh, bonding agents, uh, acidic phosphate monomers um, that when you place them into the crown, hopefully you know, are that bridge between the, the crown substrate and the resin cement. Uh, so we don't, even though they're bonding agents, we don't cure them. We would just sort of coat the inside, then blow it out, make it nice and thin, Put our cement in, and then and then seat uh, and then seat the restoration on top of the tooth. Uh, again, the newest from Premier is Universal Primer. The coolest thing about that one is it has the 10 MDP monomer plus silane. Just I like just like I mentioned, that there is some uh, research to suggest that silane in the presence of the phosphate monomer, adhesive phosphate monomer, can supercharge it, make it work a little bit better on zirconia. Uh, and then there's Z Prime. Z Prime is a, I love the name, and you probably have heard about it. Um, the only thing about Z-Prime, it has no silane in it, so it's just the adhesive uh, monomer in it. So if you like that research around what silane could do when they're both together, well, then Z-Prime doesn't have it. Um, but if you always used it and had great results, more power to you. Okay, last slide. Summary and conclusions. Remember, I believe in the garbage in, garbage out. Hopefully, I was able to give you some pearls in our short time tonight, kind of run through the story from start to finish. I love a back-to-basics approach. Please focus on the details, recognizing that even that first step, preparation, can have a huge impact on your outcome and your cementation. Um, again, match your preps with your substrate. I mean, you know pretty much when you sit down to cut that prep what kind of crown you're going to be making, so think about what kind of reduction you're going to need. I love to look at impressions, um, you know, and don't forget that, uh, you know, other teeth could be involved in the pulls and drags and everything like that. Um, again, garbage in, garbage out. You give the lab tech a crappy impression, well, expect a crappy crown in return. A match cementation with your substrate for best outcomes, uh, and then stick with what's working because you know you know don't have ten different cements in the office. It's hard to remember all those directions. Find one like we said, maybe the Goldilocks is that self adhesive resin. Again, try ZR Semprim, but we just think it's a real nice cement with that ten MDP. But find one that works and continue to use it because you'll know how to use it right. And then lastly, just a plug for our lab partners. Um, think back to that Christine case and those uh, veneers where uh, you know I could have done better with my case presentation and ask her if she liked her smile. Uh, I actually called the lab and said, you know, hey, what do you guys recommend in terms of a prep style to develop the kind of aesthetics we need? And uh, together we decided on a prep uh, uh, for those anterior teeth. And uh, it worked out fantastic because we just had a two-way conversation along the way. So again, garbage in, garbage out, and use all the tools at your disposal. And with that, I'm a little bit over time, but I want to say thank you. And uh, certainly, if there are any questions, uh, I'm happy to spend a couple of minutes doing some questions and answers. Great. Thank you. We do have a couple minutes left and some questions. Wonderful. The first one is, how did you change the temps to stop the lisping? How did I change the temps? Well, it could have been thickness. I think in her case, it wasn't length. Could have been length, but in, in, in Christine's case, it was thickness. And uh, um, so buccal lingual thickness was the problem. I needed to thin out the incisal portion of the provisionals. Um, 
Yeah, yeah, that was that was a neat case. Uh, you know, the other part of that I didn't mention about that case is that as a part of her work at the TV station, she was blogging. She was blogging the whole experience, and so she even mentioned me by name in the blog and kind of was blogging her whole journey towards her new smile. And so I was just sweating bullets on that one to make sure that we gave her exactly what she wanted. And she was super happy because I know that she was going to slam me if I didn't make it right. How do you change the temps if a patient is hissing air through their teeth? Say that again, Adam. Is it would I or have I? Uh, both. <laughs> is it, is it, yeah, certainly I would. I think if, if uh, you know, maybe if your interproximal spaces are too wide. Um, yeah, you know, this isn't a huge pro. I think it's more of an issue when we have to, like, like Matt or Christine, where I was changing shape and contour dramatically. But if you're using for single unit crowns, a matrix impression. So you have a relatively intact tooth and you make an impression of it. Um, and then what you're going to get is a provisional that's pretty close to the existing contour that they came in with. So th in those cases, it's not a huge problem. It's, it's, it's the other times when you're changing, you know, rotation and you're changing length and you're, you're you know, you're just changing a lot in terms of the, the shape of the teeth. But yes, I've had to do that. Um, and don't forget for that Matt case where he had all those congenitally missing teeth. Uh, it was my intention to keep him in provisionals for a while. I mean, I made biotems from Glidewell. And uh, to really work out uh, aesthetics, phonetics, occlusion, get all those things worked out so that when we actually went on to the final prosthesis, it really was just, I had everything done and I didn't need to worry about too much. And it worked out great. Uh, Matt, uh, yeah, I still see him at Wawa and he still smiles at me. And from time to time, I re-cement it, but you know, that gives me a chance to clean it out and make sure he's taking care of it. But uh, it's really working quite well. And I think we're about... I want to say I'm probably six or seven years in on that one. So all things good so far. Can you share your technique of registering good crown margins on an impression? Wow. Uh, I don't even know if we have enough time for that one, but um, so I think it starts with, you're going to register good crown margin on an impression. You have to actually get them in the, in, the, in the prep. I mean, you have to develop them as a part of your prepping. And to do that, um, you got to use, to me, I use, I like using new diamonds. That's why I, I showed solo because I really don't like using older diamonds that, you know, don't, aren't cutting efficiently. Um, and again, I don't have a like 15 burr, 15 burr, burr block that I'm choosing from. I just usually have just a few, but you know, you got to get your prep right in order to be able to record it, right? If you don't have good finish lines in the prep, how can you record them because they're not even there? Uh, to me, I also think that, um, I mean, I use medium or coarse diamonds most of the time, but I end up using fine diamonds for those last uh, few times around the tooth so that I can really be crisp with it. Uh, so I use different grits uh, and recognizing actually that there's some literature to say that a smoother prep actually works better for cementation, especially if you're going to use resin. So this idea of a smoother prep actually uh, is easier to bond to and probably develops better bond strength. So to me, I like a medium course for most everything until the end, I'll use a, a fine diamond. And then one other technique for impressioning that I think people get a lot, of confu a lot of confusion about is if you've ever actually placed wash material into the mouth and blown air on it, um, why are you doing that? Um, you probably don't need to do that because of the... Um, the hydrophilicity of common impression materials now, like the vinyls have, have come a long way and then the, the ethers have always been good in that respect. Um, but um, why do you blow air on your impression material when you place it in? A lot of people think it's sort of driving impression material down and into the sulcus. Uh, but in fact, that's not the reason you're doing it. You're actually creating uniform surface tension or breaking surface tension so that things flow better. So understanding your techniques, um, why you're doing the things you're gonna do, proper tray seating, um, using the right materials, meaning, hey, am I using super fast when I've only got 30 seconds of working time versus more of a, a fast or a regular set, which gives me a, you know, a minute to a minute and 30 of working time. All of those things play a role in really get, capturing great impressions. Now on the, on the scanning side, right, we're gonna be, keep it dry. We're gonna do good tissue management. Um, and we're, you know, we're going to, uh, um, you know, make our, our, our internal line angles rounded and all that good stuff. So there's so many things to think about. But to me, it's always a back to basics. You know, all the things we learned and then we started skipping, um, 
you know, if I, if the important part of that first visit is getting the impression, I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure that it, it, I get it right the first time and, uh, and that we can record it perfectly. Great. Well, one hour on the dot. So that'll do it for us tonight. I would like to thank you, Dr. J Dr. Goodchild, for your insightful presentation. If anyone has additional questions that we were unable to answer, please feel free to email us at webinars at henryshine.com or feel free to email Dr. Goodchild directly. Everyone attending tonight's webinar will receive a link to view the recording in the coming week via email. On behalf of Henry Shine and Premier Dental, thank you all for attending and have a great night. Thanks, guys.